<laughs> Sorry about the mix up there, folks. We made a last minute decision to make use of our mic system in here rather than trying to jerry rig it over in the FLC. <laughs> school in Lubbock. I also did Canyon High School. And then there's another one, well there's the one that's in Lubbock on the right side and then there's another one on the left side in, the, in actually the little town. I used to love that town because we would go to the theater. There was only one catch at the theater. If eight people didn't show up, they wouldn't show a movie because they wouldn't break even. So we had at least eight people in there with Jeff Butler in the concession and everything. <laughs> Uh, it's up. It's up to y'all. Um, the that mic there will be for questions and comments. Uh, I know we're not a sit in the front pews kind of congregation, so if everyone's comfortable where they are, that's all right. We'll give it just a couple of minutes, let folks trickle in. (laughs) 
I'll reiterate what our AV engineer just put in the comments on the Facebook live stream that uh, we will see questions and comments which are put in to the Facebook live stream and Dylan and I will do our best to address those as we can throughout the night as well. The, the document that Don is passing around right now is an article that sort of summarizes the big headline uh, that we're going to be talking about in a little more detail tonight. Folks, we are about to go ahead and begin. Um, I invite you to now join me as we enter a time of prayer that the Lord may be with us and would bless this evening. Let us pray. Holy and almighty God, we know that you are with us. Help us to know that you are with us. We know that you have a plan and that you guide our steps. Help us to walk that path. And Lord, with the information that is presented, with the questions that are asked, with the emotions and thoughts that are shared, Lord, let the name of Jesus Christ be known in us all, even in uncertain times, even in uncertain futures. Help Jesus to be our King in all of our hearts, in all of our minds, in all ways. And we ask in his name and pray. Amen. Friends, this is a town hall that we are putting on tonight to discuss what I have called um, frequently recently the denominational issue. And I don't know how effective of a term that is, but it is all I can really think to call it to sum up uh, everything that it has been and everything that it encompasses uh, is not simple or easy, and in fact, um, the information is even somewhat limited. I will share with you tonight uh, what I know and things that I th have heard and think are as close to objective as possible. Uh, I, I will begin with a report on this issue, and I'll explain more in a second about this denominational issue, in quotes. Uh, I'll begin with a report, and then we'll have an open mic here set up uh, here at the, about the third pew, and we will invite um, anyone who wants to come and ask a question or who wants to even share a, a comment or uh, voice their feelings a little bit. You are invited to do so on this mic. And a couple of things on that. Um, this is... 
the, the term safe space has, has taken on a bit of a connotation, but I would like for this to be a space where we are comfortable each individual person to ask the questions that they want to ask, to share the feelings they want to share. We are a church family, and I hope that this can be a space where the family can talk to each other, can ask maybe hard questions, or share what is truly on their heart. I'd ask in line with that as well, that um, you who do want to ask a question or share a comment, uh, that you would um, not filter yourself, but that you would speak lovingly and in a way that honors God, which is um, sometimes a stumbling block for all of us, especially about uh, issues that can raise up emotions in people. Emotions are okay. I think uh, particular stones that get thrown sometimes at people that people groups that may not be present in the room or may be present in the room are not what we're trying to do here tonight. I'll reiterate again that for those who are joining us uh, online via the Facebook live stream, uh, please do, if you have questions or comments as well, share those in this Facebook question and comment section. Both Dylan and I are monitoring that and we'll do our best to make sure that your voice is heard as well. All right. With that being said, the denominational issue. I will lead with the headline, and then I will ask that you pay attention to the, the details as I continue to talk and share what is going on in our United Methodist Church denomination. But the headline is this. The Nadu denomination called the Global Methodist Church, the GMC for short, formed into an official organized entity May 1st, this past Sunday. It is a new denomination, and uh, churches, people, conferences will be able to join this new denomination um, in their own timing, but if they so desire, they can break away and go. It is, in some terms, a church split. I want to start with a little bit of background. So the church split um, is... Well, the, the original impetus for the church split is the theological issue of LGBTQ plus persons or human sexuality or gay marriage. There are a few different terms that we have used for this over the years. That, that is the initial driving issue behind this church split. It is not the only issue anymore, but it is the original issue. Uh, the background uh, that I believe is relevant here is that, so the United Methodist Church, we have uh, what is similar to a constitution called the Book of Discipline. Now each um, region called a conference in the United Methodist Church is its own independent entity, almost like a country or a nation state, but each of those countries is supposed to adhere to our book of discipline. Now the book of discipline, since I believe the early 70s, has had clear language concerning the denomination's theology of the issue of human sexuality. The Book of Discipline has maintained that uh, to act on, to um, whether you are a gay person or you are a priest uh, sort of doing a, a gay wedding, to act on that is a sin in the eyes of God and is against the Book of Discipline. That, that has been in our bylaws for 50 years. It went um, mostly unchallenged until probably the 21st century. Uh, now, that is still in the Book of Discipline right now. Our Book of Discipline right now clearly states that that is our policy, that is our theology, that we do not affirm gay marriage and that we do not affirm the ordination as in, as in gay people serving as pastors of practicing LGBTQ plus persons. That has been challenged by some, or at least that has been... Um, criticized by some in our larger denomination, um, and, it, and that criticism has become somewhat more popular in recent years. Uh, there are those who argue the theological point that we should allow gay marriage and allow the ordination of practicing gay clergy. But right now, it is not allowed. The only way that it could change is at uh, the level of general conference. The general conference is the 
largest authority, the highest authority in our denomination right now. They are the only ones who can change the book of discipline. A few years ago, there was a motion put forward to change the book of discipline to become affirming, is the word uh, that gets thrown around a lot, of gay marriage and affirming that is in support of the ordination of practicing gay clergy. That motion was defeated. And in fact, at that same general conference a handful of years ago, I, the, the exact year escapes me, um, they in fact strengthened our language around being against and opposed to gay marriage and the ordination of practicing gay clergy. Well, that didn't necessarily make the issue go away because those who wanted the, our denomination to become affirming didn't give up the fight. And uh, the next general conference was scheduled to be in 2020 where this issue might be brought up again. Another issue that would have been brought up at the general conference in 2020 was whether or not if that we could not reconcile this issue in our house that we should go through a divorce a church split there were some proposals drafted for the united methodist church to basically split in two and there were different proposals whether the individual churches decide which direction they wanted to go with or there were other proposals on how to do that of course the pandemic happened in 2020, and so general conference did not happen in 2020, but it was delayed to 2021. The reasons being, I mean, many travel wasn't really possible for a lot of the people, and we are a global international denomination. When the delegates from general conference get together, those delegates are coming from uh, every inhabited continent on this planet. We weren't able to convene in general conference in 2020, and that made people rightfully upset because we have been talking about this, and some people have been fighting about this for, for quite a long time. Well, the pandemic lingered into 2021 when we were supposed to have general conference, and so it was delayed again until this year, 2022. And we were hopeful to have general conference here in 2022, where we could hopefully, one way or another, put the issue to bed. The, we were not able to have, it was postponed again, the general conference was. We were not able to uh, have it for a couple of reasons. There are still some travel restrictions, mostly pandemic related, around the globe from people that would need to attend this conference. There were restrictions on, well, there's a lack of medical access and vaccine access. There is a lack of technological access. They did consider hosting general conference over Zoom, but a lot of our Methodist brothers and sisters in parts of Africa and other parts of the world that was not an option for them, and so General Conference was delayed. In fact, General Conference is supposed to be every four years. It was supposed to be in 2020, and the, um, the council decided that rather than push it back to 2023 and then have a General Conference both in 23 and then our regularly scheduled one in 24, it has just been postponed until 2024 on its normal schedule. So that is where that issue is at. Right now, we are a decidedly conservative denomination on the issue of human sexuality. Our book of discipline has clear theological language that affirms the conservative traditional view of marriage and of the ordination of people who are in line with that. That being said, there are those um, who would style themselves and have styled themselves conservatives on this issue, traditionalists on the issue of human sexuality, uh, who have uh, taken the initiative of themselves to break away on their own and form this new denomination on their own. Um, the reasons stated being is that they are tired of the delays to general conference and they are tired of it being a topic of conversation, and in some respects, well, it has somewhat dominated um, conversation for the past several years. It is a, a true hot button issue. And because of that, um, they are not waiting for the general conference in 2024 to find out what happens. They are going uh, their own way. They are forming this new global Methodist church denomination, which will be a denomination very clearly and very staunchly opposed to gay marriage and opposed to the ordination of practicing gay clergy. <clears throat> there are other changes to that as well, uh, which I, we spoke more about at the board meeting and I won't go into them all here. I do want to emphasize that 
the new denomination is not just copy paste the United Methodist Church, but is decidedly conservative on the issue of human sexuality, is that there are changes to the way the churches are governed, the way the churches are structured, to the appointment system for pastors. Uh, and I'll, I'm not going to go into all of those details tonight. Uh, I, I will when the time comes if we suddenly find ourselves in this new denomination or approaching this new denomination, but I will leave it at that for tonight. So. The Global Methodist Church exists. It is a new denomination and a handful of churches have already joined it. Churches both in the United States and Europe, I know for sure, have already joined this new denomination. There are two resolutions up at our annual conference. So this is the annual conference of our conference, which is the Galveston, Houston, East Texas area. We are called the Texas Annual Conference. We have our own bishop. We have we are pretty much autonomous, like all conferences, in and of ourselves. Our annual conference is always on the last weekend of May every year. It's when all the pastors, all the clergy, all the lay delegates and lay leaders get together and do all sorts of things, including voting on resolutions. And there are two resolutions being put forward at this annual conference, which are particularly relevant to this topic of conversation. The first resolution is that we would hold a special conference this fall to discern whether or not to join this new denomination. Now, the resolution is technically about whether or not to have this special conference in, I believe, September to talk about the issue. To be blunt, if that resolution passes, it will be a given that when that conference comes in September that we will join the new denomination. So for almost all intents and purposes, if this given resolution passes, we will expect to be in a new denomination uh, by next year, probably at the earliest. That is in the Global Methodist Church denomination if that resolution passes. The other resolution, so right now the, that resolution is, uh, requires just a simple majority to pass as well. Uh, if that happens, that means that you know 51% to 49% in favor of doing this means that 100% of the conference will go and become a part of the new denomination. And this uh, vote will also be binding. And this is a really key point. I mean that if this vote passes and we do decide to join this new denomination, we will be joining it as a conference, which means that everyone in the conference Every church, every pastor, every member of the Methodist Church in our conference will then be joined along to joining this new denomination. And um, that is only going to be voted on at the conference level, at the annual conference and at the special conference if it happens this fall as well. And what that means is that the local churches will not be getting to vote on this issue themselves. Uh, the only people that will be voting on this are uh, ordained clergy and uh, certified lay, de not certified, but uh, the approved lay delegates. Uh, for us, that means that our lay leader, John Playa, will be having a, a vote on this issue and he will be representing our church. I am not actually ordained though, I am only a provisional elder on the path to ordination and so therefore I will not be having a vote. Uh, so if this vote passes to reiterate uh, at this annual conference, and it requires right now only a simple majority to do so, then we will hold a special conference again this fall in September where almost certainly in that case we will be voting as a conference to join the new denomination and in that case everyone in the conference will be joining. Uh, the other resolution, that was all about the first resolution, the, uh, the other resolution is to raise the threshold for that vote to pass from a simple majority to a two-thirds super majority. Right now, 51% and the vote passes. If this other resolution passes, it will require 67% uh, yes in order to pass and for us to, in that case, join this new denomination. Uh, so. If that happens, and if we do have this special conference in the fall, and we do join the global, excuse me, Methodist Church, uh, then that will be that. Our church, um, I don't know the exact start date, 
but if not later this fall, then next year, will now no longer be a United Methodist Church, but we will be a global Methodist Church. Uh, this and our chairman, Bruce, is, uh, is an expert at this, but uh, that includes all sort of legal financial issues, uh, some of which I've tried and failed to comprehend, uh, others of which have yet to actually be worked out. I'm not going to go into a lot of those details tonight because I would make a bit of a fool of myself if I tried. And frankly, we don't have a lot of answers to a lot of the questions that could be asked. One uh, particular point I will make about the financial aspect, though, is that if a church, any church, whether it's us or a church in Houston, finds themselves in a situation where we've gone to the Global Methodist Church, it, it is in a binding way, and that local church has decided that we don't want to do this. They are allowed to disaffiliate from the conference, which means that they will be allowed to take the initiative to hold their own vote and decide on their own to leave the Global Methodist Church and to, well, do whatever they want from there, whether that's to go independent or return to the United Methodist Church or to go to one of the other uh, Wesleyan Methodist denominations or to go Baptist for uh, that matter as well. Uh, that will be possible, but there are uh, this is a bit of speculation, but there, there are likely to be some financial implications to that disaffiliation as well. And um, I believe that I'm probably forgetting something, but I believe that is the nuts and bolts of the issue. Uh, no, of course, one more thing, big thing. So um, we have a Supreme Court equivalent in our denomination, and the name is escaping me, but uh, the Judicial Council, the Judicial Council. They are right now uh, looking at the case of whether or not an entire conference can vote to leave as an entire conference and go to a new denomination. There are some questions about whether it's legal, according to our Book of Discipline, for the conference to, in a binding way, that would, is in some ways against some people's will, join a new denomination. The Judicial Council is reviewing that right now, and we are expected to get an answer about whether or not such a move is legal and possible in about a week, maybe more. Uh, I will be on honeymoon when that decision likely comes down. <laughs> and uh, if they say yes, that is a legal move, then Everything will proceed as I've just explained. If they say no, that's not a legal move, well then we're back on the wild, wild west and we don't know what's going to happen because that will mean that those resolutions which I just discussed won't be possible. And uh, in which case, who knows? We could speculate, but who knows? So um, that should be where we are at now, uh, the, 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 big, the big things we're waiting on are that Judicial Council decision within the next couple of weeks and on whether or not the resolution to basically join the GMC passes at our annual conference at the end of May, which will be in the last couple of days in May, maybe the first day of June. They haven't released the schedule yet. I would like to open it up now to people to come forward and ask questions or to post comments. I know that this is... Um, I mean, this is, this is a, a big issue, uh, and I'd like to invite people to speak now. So okay. Some more details on what Quinn just said. Uh, I'm John Pye, for those that don't know me. Can everybody hear me okay here? I'm going to have to go in the mic. Okay, that better? Am I good? Okay. There are now four vote provisions. The first one is ban hate speech in the Methodist Church. A ban hate speech. Apparently during this time that Quinn's been talking about there's been some anger and let's just say non-Methodist ways of speaking. So that's going to be the first vote. The second one, it was hollow to, hard to follow but it's the forward with love. Same type of thing is we're going to move forward, we're not going to throw stones at each other as we go through. Then the two-thirds vote to 51 percent vote and then the vote on the conference uh, coming in. The other things they were talking about, as Quinn said, on the financial, on how are we gonna, do we have to buy our own church back if we switch? Do we have to do this? They said, we're working on it, we don't know. 
That's the answer from the bishops at this moment. They're still working on it. They're planning on what's going to happen there. Um, there is a third congregation in the Methodist Church that is growing right now. So we have the UMC, the new GMC, and there's an FMC, is the Free Methodist Church. That is uh, actually had, I think, uh, 50 to 60 new members over the last two weeks up in Dallas area in the Panhandle and such. So there is a third option in there. I don't have details on that. I haven't followed up on that yet. But that is another one of those that if we choose not to go to either one, we have that option. We don't know the details of what that would do with the church property taxes or 501, any of that stuff at this point. The free is very conservative as well. They just didn't want to go global with the new one. Free Methodist Church has been around for about 40 years. And it is a little more conservative than we are. Um, I don't know where they go compared to the global. So that's the update that I got over our pre-conference meetings we've had over the last couple of days. Thank you. The, I'll add on the Free Methodist Church. The, it has been around in some form since um, the slavery era of the country. That is where they get their free name from. They took, a, they took a stance on that one and broke away from the other denomination at the time. That is one of our other uh, Wesleyan Methodist denominations that a church can join if it comes to it, if that's what the church wants to do. Other questions? Yeah. I know that we need rules, and that's why we have the Book of Discipline. But this is the first Book of Discipline, and I want to see this when I go to church. And I have read, I've been reading, I've been real busy this week, but like everyone, but uh, Quinn's right. I, I don't know about y'all, but there's not, what you find to read is not real detailed. And uh, from what I've read, it looks to me like they have been working on this Global Methodist Church for a, a while. So I think they need to have their P's and Q's together when they come together and get started so people can understand better, people like me. So this is all I want to say. This is the original book of discipline to me and my heart, and this is what I want to see when I go to church. Thank you for sharing, Gayla. Would anyone else like to pose a question or a comment? Come on up, Mike. Okay, the um, whole thing on this thing started when the gays and such started pushing to be recognized to fit into the churches. Well, the United Methodist Church is worldwide. It's not just the United States, it's not just Europe. Most of the what you want to call the third world countries, like all of Africa and South America and other places like that, are at least as conservative as we are, if not more so. None of them wanted anything to do with the uh, gays and uh, et cetera being in their churches as ministers, as leaders. And they did not want gay marriages. <coughs> And effectively, the Archbishop or whoever it is of, of Africa said, we're going to create a global um, church. And if you want to join us, fine. If you don't want to join us, then you don't have to. But that is the main emphasis that I have seen over the last 30 years at least of uh, people wondering what was going on and why they were pushing it. The United States has got uh, more gays involved, I guess is the best way to put it, than any of these other countries do, except possibly uh, England. And um, 
they are not interested in having the uh, gay people in, as part of the clergy. That goes back to several cases of, of us having gays in the clergy in the United States where they started preaching that from the pulpit, which is something that I've always been against. Not necessarily against the gays being preached from the pulpit, but politics being preached from the pulpit. And uh, I think most of you can agree with it. But uh, I don't think that they're going to be able to, to make a um, decision. Now, this is my personal opinion. I haven't seen anything in writing. I don't think they're going to be able to come back and say, the United Methodist Church is going to take over all the property. Because that's not going to be uh, ignored when they come down to the finalized decision of whether to, uh, how they're going to split it up. So I personally don't think we got anything to worry about as far as the uh, losing the church and everything else here to, if we decide to go with global. Thank you for sharing, Mike. Go ahead, Johnny. I got two questions. Uh, and they're kind of generic questions. My, one of them is, will the new denomination continue with the existing discipline, supposing that the other side would rewrite its own discipline? No, the Global Methodist Church discipline is different than the United Methodist Church discipline. Right now, there's no indication that the United Methodist Church is going to be changing its own discipline. I, I didn't. I, I didn't catch all of that. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, let me say one thing before we get into any other discussion. So, um, what? Well, now you got me sidetracked. It's okay. Obviously, it wasn't that big a deal. We may circle back to that in just a second. Let me talk about my second one. Since we would have to go with the entire conference, in your opinion, what is the feel with the, within the conference on how or which way to go? Which way they would think the vote's going to go or? Our Texas conference. Yeah, it's, it, we, are, we are a huge conference. It, I, I'm not trying to cop out here, but there are tons of people just on both sides of the issue. I could muddy the waters a little bit in the sense that there are self-avowed conservatives and traditionalists on the, hum, uh, on the issue of human sexuality that are not planning on joining the Global Methodist Church right now. There are those, of course, that, that are planning on joining the Global Methodist Church, whether or not we go as a conference. There are, there are clergy and there are churches that, even if we don't vote as a conference to join the Global Methodist Church, uh, can and will choose to go through the disaffiliation process where they will, as their own local church or as their own person, join the new denomination. As for the feeling of what's going to happen, I, I wish I had um, more of a pulse to read, but unfortunately I don't. Um, I, I don't have any direct quotes to quote, and some do uh, do want to wait and see what happens, right? So even if the globe, even if certain churches, certain conferences do um, want to be. Um, conservative on this issue, to be traditionalist on this issue. Um, I mean, there's no telling what 
is going to happen at the general conference in 2024. There's no firm indication. Like there is, there is no plan in place right now that is going to just happen where suddenly in 2024 the United Methodist Church is going to be liberal on the issue of human sexuality. That is that might come up. It's probably going to come up for a vote, but it lost last time. And in fact, we strengthened our language last time against the issue of human sexuality. And so there's not necessarily a need in the eyes of some to break off and form a new denomination. Others um, on the... Some do think that they're jumping the gun. Um, others are concerned more about the financial, legal, and church structure issues, which are coming with the new denomination. And because um, there are some changes, and some of that change is speculation. Some of it is already in their book of discipline, which you can view online as it is now. It's not a full book of discipline, but it does have some of the, the key parts of it. Uh, there, are, there are some changes. It's, it is not just a theological issue as it stands right now. How can they expect us to make a decision when they don't have answers for so much of it yet? How can we make an informed decision? Well, um, <laughs> you know, I think that... Um, the, the answer to that is that our, our church, Sweeney First United Methodist Church, isn't making a decision. Yes. I don't think that we can make a fully informed decision as of this moment. That is what um, certain leadership has decided to do. Uh, I can speak to a couple of those specific issues that you've just raised, and not in full scope, but in the Global Methodist Church Book of Discipline, right now our property is not owned by us. I don't, I, I don't know if that's common knowledge here or not. Our property is owned by the conference level. Um, in the Global Methodist Church, actually, the local church will come to own their own property, not the conference level. How does that work? What are the finances involved? I don't know the answer to that question. But I can, at least that is in their current book of discipline right now. You will not be losing me unless they pry me away. <laughs> so there are no at least publicly facing gay pastors in our conference right now. Our, our bishop is a traditionalist and a conservative on the issue of human sexuality, and he has enforced that in our particular conference. In the Texas conference? Yes. Okay. The United Methodist Church, I mean, if, if our conference suddenly goes and becomes Global Methodist Church as of this year or next year or whenever it is, the United Methodist Church discipline is not necessarily changing. There are votes to change the discipline on a few different things, almost every general conference. I think it's rare for those votes to pass, historically speaking. Changes to the discipline are hard to accomplish. That is some, some will probably always want them to change that, but that doesn't mean that it's going to happen. But it if has to happen, how can they allow gay, lesbian leaders? So, uh, again, right now our conference doesn't. So, uh, I compared an, an annual conference to uh, a state or a, or a country earlier. Um, our bishop is the highest authority in our annual conference, and that goes for any annual conference. The thing is, is that right now the bishops have pretty much autonomy 
to enforce what they want to and don't want to. So you do have in some conferences, particularly on the West Coast and in the Northeast, where some bishops have ignored that part of the Book of Discipline and have allowed gay marriage and the ordination of practicing gay clergy. Yes, I, I'm, and I'm sorry, can, can, is it okay? Are people so comfortable coming up to the mic so that everyone can hear and that the online folks can also hear? Or do we... I just, I mean, to me it seems silly if, if the, why are we, the United Methodist Church, why aren't we just staying the way that we are and let other people go global because the Book of Discipline is not changing. And to me you're saying that the bishops, some of them, have decided to overlook that part of the Book of Discipline. Well, I want to go to a Bible-based church. And I want um, anyone in this room or elsewhere to please show me I've only seen in the Bible what I've read, and it says no, that uh, gays or lesbians, whoever, are a sinner just like I am, and I probably sin more than they do, but we come to this church to worship. I can't find anywhere where it says that a marriage should be between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. So is there, what, what are they going off of in the Bible that makes this okay? I will, I, I'm not judging. I just want to understand if there's another way that I've not read something I'd like to know. Uh, the, I, I can't give a robust theological argument of that position. Can you tell um, me some scripture in the Bible that would support this? Not off the top of my head. And um, I, I only say that to say that and people on both sides of this issue believe in the authority of the Bible. I, I want to offer that up as, as humbly and lovingly as I can. People on both sides of this issue do believe in God and in our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit and in the authority of the Scripture. I have not memorized these arguments, but when I was in seminary, I did encounter arguments based off the Bible and based off theology for being affirming of gay marriage and for the ordination of practicing gay clergy. And um, I, 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 you know, I wish that I had paid a little more attention to that argument because I, I didn't know if I would have to regurgitate it at the time, but I know it, it could be useful now, and um, I, I guess that's all I can say right Can now anyone in one. this room tell me a scripture where it says it's okay? I want to go by what the Bible says. To me, that's what church is, and if, we, if somebody can show me, and I'm not downing anybody or trying to judge, I'm just trying to understand. You want to come up, Mike? Okay, there is no Bible verse that says it's okay. The people that are pushing this, now I'm getting this off the of internet. And I've been doing a lot of reading on this on the internet. The people that are pushing this, uh, one of the things that uh, they're saying, which I totally disagree with, is that uh, Jesus loves everybody. As a result, according to them, when we die, no matter what we've done during our life, no matter how we stand with uh, believing in Jesus, going to church, or anything else, everybody will be pardoned. Nobody will go to hell, according to them. Which is against what the Bible says. Uh, but they're big on that right now. They're also stating that since Jesus loves everybody and we're supposed to be like Jesus, we have to love and accept them as they are. And as a result of that, they're saying that we're wrong and that everybody, they are right. Those are the two main arguments. There's a few other smaller arguments along in this but they're not as uh, 
prevalent as those two main arguments. So if you're looking for something in the Bible, saving that... Uh, Chris, I got one more. Go ahead. I'm getting in line. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're looking for something in the Bible that says it's okay, it's not there. Thank or you for coming I've up, Mike. Found it. Thank you for that. The only thing I want to say is I do love and and respect their right to live their lifestyle the way they want to. I have many friends that are. I know people that are. I have no judgment against them. I think they should, like I said, be in this church just like I am because we're all sinners. A sin is a sin. The Bible says so. And so, but the problem that I want to understand is it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible where it's okay. So I just think we have to get in our Bible, if there's gay and lesbians listening or however you want to go, we need to be in our Bible and read what it says and try to make an honest decision on our relationship with God and what he actually wants from us. We can love each other no matter who we are. I smoke, that's a sin. I, I drink sometimes, that's a sin. You know, it's, it's all about our lifestyles. I know what's wrong and it's my relationship with Jesus, but I'm not gonna stand up here as a leader in the church and affirm that those things are okay because I know that they're not. Thank you, Mary. Okay, I do have a question about, um, I guess the business side of it, well not the business, the, the voting, John, this is you, you're on. Do bigger churches than Sweeney, F-U-M-C, have more than one vote? Okay, so everybody has a vote unless you have a preacher that can vote. I, Ministerial vote. Okay. That is not my understanding. Okay. My understanding is that uh, larger churches, I believe, are allowed more delegates. Furthermore, if larger churches have multiple ordained pastors on staff, all of those okay. ordained pastors That's are also allowed what I was getting to. a vote. So if you have a head pastor and three associates plus two lay leaders, they're going to get five votes? Uh, yes, I believe in that case. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm not exactly sure as to the mechanics of how that was decided, but we were given the one lay delegate. Um, I would only be speculating as to why the one. By the yes, it would be either by the conference or by the district. Well, that's curious to me. Okay. Next question, Quinn, or Pastor Quinn, you probably can answer this. Is it true, because I've been doing research for about three years, that the largest church in the Texas Annual Conference, which is in Katy, has already pulled out. I don't know what the largest church in our annual conference is. <laughs> I apologize. I didn't either. I didn't either. That they've already pulled out. Yes. Okay. And it's a friend of mine goes to a very large church in Klein, and they're having town halls like we are, and. Um, I mean, it's large. They have three worship services every Sunday. And she said, to quote her, we are buying our way out of UMC. Part of the disaffiliation process right now does include some costs. Um, some of those costs right now, we, we know at least um, a couple of the numbers to disaffiliate right now is uh, two years apportionments on top of a sort of undefined number, which depends on the church, uh, regarding pensions uh, for that, uh, that every church already pays to. But uh, to disaffiliate from the conference right now, again, this conference is right now UMC, and right. we have had churches, I don't know exactly which church, um, who have left to join the more conservative Free Methodist denomination, and we have had churches that have left to join the more liberal uh, United Church of Christ, among others, I believe, and they have had to pay uh, two years worth of apportionments as well as whatever is calculated they owe as far as the pension. If our denomination or if our conference changes denomination and we decide to then that we don't want to do that and do somewhere else, it's not exactly clear if that same cost is going to be put on us, but it's not clear that it's not going to be. That's my current understanding. Uh, that was my understanding. Okay. Now that that could be wrong. You you probably 
So it would be 21, 2021, and 2022. I don't know. I don't do numbers. Uh, in, in speaking with Bruce a little bit about this, and you know, I haven't actually uh, checked to confirm whether it was just to make sure that we've paid last year's and this year's. That is a blind spot in my research. Under the assumption that we would have to pay two years apportionments, I believe that that by itself is going to be about 17k for us on top but, but of... But if we've already paid... Okay. I mean, if I would love for you to be right. I would too. I mean, I, w I would just love to know. But um, because I think that's a huge thing. But having said that, Mary, I completely agree with you. There's the business side for me, and then there's the theological side for me. And then if we're saying, okay, it's, it's great, the United Methodist Church isn't going to change their language, and Sweeney FUMC is not going to change at all, but you're still involved in a, in a church denomination that's not following the Bible. It's pretty clear. My, my opinion. <clears throat> okay. For those asking Sherry Van Avery about the um, Book of Discipline for the Global, you can read it. Go to globalmethodist.org. Methodist it's right there. You can read every bit of it. Yeah, it's transitional because it's a, it's a work in progress. Yeah. Okay. Well, they're not global. They're F they're what are you asking me? They're not global. Okay, how does it affect us? No, but you're part of that group. So you have to decide, and that's a personal opinion. Are you okay? Exactly. And that's just something everybody would have to decide. Is it, is it okay, you know, to be involved in that group, even though they're not following the book of discipline? Are you, you know, at the end of the day... M Mary, would you no. like to, uh, Mary Lou, would you like to come up to the mic? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's open mic. Do your work. Would you ask, okay, this question has been posed to me by a member, and I'm not naming names, Mary Lou, but <laughs> 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 if we stay UMC, okay, and, and I'm not going to lie to y'all, UMC is comfortable. We know what it is. We know the rules. We know what they stand for. Okay? So, and there's, it's scary as all heck to move to something we don't know. That's scary. No. No. The, the, the question is, uh, oh, is ask there... Oh, asking online? Okay, I'm sorry. She wanted me to repeat it. I thought you were asking me. I don't know. Okay, the question asked for online, if your church chooses not to follow the book of discipline, is there repercussion or punishment for the clergy? It is up to the bishop of that conference to whether or not to enforce punishment. That is changing in the Global Methodist Church discipline. The Global Methodist Church uh, discipline has indicated that it will be instituting um, accountability that if there is uh, a pastor or a lay leader or someone else higher up than, than just a local church pastor who is in violation of the discipline, that, that person can face uh, the repercussions of that. Come to the microphone. They're not doing that. The question is, I believe, why can't we punish? That was decided. They're not doing that. The, the, so the question is, why isn't the liberal side leaving?
Uh, sorry to interrupt, but could you please step up to the mic? question that I had like several years ago when all this became apparent was why is it the ones that want to stay like we are that are following the discipline why are we have to leave and lose our uh, our flame and cross and all that kind of stuff we and those that aren't on the west coast and you know that aren't following it why aren't they like kicked out of the religion kind of well, we, we don't have a means to, to kick anybody out um, right Why now. Why not if you don't follow rules? The, we don't have, it is not in the discipline that we can remove a bishop right now. I'm not speaking to like the ethics of that or if that's good or bad or not. Okay. That just doesn't, the means for that don't exist right now. Okay, so it's not in the book of discipline. But in the book of discipline, it is in there as to what they're doing. So I don't understand that. Uh, well, to speak to the first part of your question, why are we, I mean, we don't have to leave. There is, it is a choice that certain right. leaders are making to leave, probably because they, are, you know, don't want to be associated with people in their denomination that are acting on. I mean, that's me. That's me putting words in people's mouth. I try not to do that. But uh, certain people are making the choice to leave. They have a particular side that they side on this on, and that is the choice that they are making. And uh, there's nothing else I can really speak well, to. Well, I think that. the major choice people are leaving is because. It's not being done what the Bible tells us to do. I mean, following the Bible, that's those that are leaving, it's because that's not being followed. I think the other big issue, why a lot of them aren't, like you talked about, some of them are going to stay until 24 and see what happens. I think most of that's a financial issue. I mean, you're talking about retirements of people. For instance, what's going to happen to all the Methodist hospitals, SMU, you know, all the private schools? Where are they going? You know, they're not going to go if they're afraid they're going to lose their money. I, I can't answer those questions. I don't know what the hospital or uh, the schools are going to be doing. Okay. But, I mean, I think a lot of pastors that would like to switch probably won't because of they're afraid of the, they'll lose their retirement. I don't think that they're trying to take away anybody's retirement here. Um, I. Yeah, I think people on both sides of this issue, even if there are strong feelings on both sides, are trying to do this in a way that they believe is good and right. You know, I don't, I don't think anyone is trying to steal from another. Uh, okay. Now, our bishop is Scott Jones, correct? Correct. And he, isn't he the one that's fixing to go ahead and retire because of all this and maybe take up to be a bishop in the new Global Methodist? That, that is not uh, my understanding. Um, the bishop is not expected to, there's a mandatory retirement age. Um, I, I want to say that it is 72, but that is, that is a bit of a guess. Emma's nodding, it is 72. Uh, the, so the bishop's not supposed to retire until he hits that age, which I believe would be in a few years. Okay. He does have time still. Uh, bef before, five years, so he has five years. Uh, the only thing that could force him to retire, he doesn't want to retire. He's made that very clear. Okay, he had a blog that I watched. That's why I was wondering. Sure. He had a blog and he said that he was going to be retiring. There, there is a mechanism in place that could force him to retire that is a bit long-winded. We, the force to retire is in literally if something uh, happens if a ju uh, jurisdictional conference happens this fall. I don't believe we know if it's going to or not. Then it's been uh, X amount of jurisdictional conferences that he has been a bishop. I believe is the logic, and therefore he will be forced to retire. He does not want that to happen. He does not want to retire early. He has been honest about that. He's not looking to duck and run. I think. In fact, our bishop is a self-avowed conservative on this issue of human sexuality, and I think our bishop is very much wanting to see us as a whole conference transition over to the new denomination and for him to continue presiding as bishop over us in the new denomination until his retirement age. All right, and even if we went to the global Methodist denomination, we could still be called First Methodist Church Sweeney, is that correct? That is not correct. As long as you don't have the United in it? 
Yes, the United would be the issue. We would have to 501c3. Right. Well, I mean, like on the front of our church, it says First Methodist Ch Church. No, that it does, does not say United. It does on the family on the Family Life Center, but you take that down. And if I'm correct, Johnny, don't our bank statements also just say First Methodist Church? I think the I think those the would be the legal actually, financial issues yeah. that uh, are not so yet all solved. That and others, but. Well, for those of you that haven't seen it, I don't know if you've seen the logo that they've come out with for the greater for the uh, Global Methodist Church, since we would if you went that direction, would lose the traditional cross and flame. And if I'm correct, it's uh, like three circles. It's got the, it's three circles with the, yeah, Father, yeah, for the Trinity, and then a cross in it. And, and if, if we didn't have all of our uh, people in Africa and the Philippines and everywhere, this conversation wouldn't even be going on because we would not really have a choice because the United States votes liberal. So that's, I'm that's glad that they sometimes they at least canceled some of those conferences because those people can get here from the other countries for their delegates to vote. Thank you for coming up, Renee. Go ahead. So the churches, if they decide to go global, they actually do have a conference that they'll be going with. Uh, it depends on how whoever chooses to go to the new denomination. Um, if the vote passes this May uh, and we have the special conference in September, then our whole conference will be going to become the Global Methodist Church and, you know, we'll still be in Sweeney and we'll still be in this district and we'll still be in this conference. We'll just be in a new denomination. Okay. Which means all sorts of other changes, but uh, I, I, you know, a church can disaffiliate on their own. A local church, we we could hold a vote if we wanted to after some time to disaffiliate on our own as a local church. In which case, it would just where are we going? What is their structure? It, it's very contextual. Okay. And just one more question. This John applies to you, and Quinn can probably back back up the answer to this. But I'm curious. You're the one going to vote for this church. So how do you decide how you're going to vote? Do we all get a vote and you take that to them, or is this your personal vote? How does this work? Yes, please. Me and Quinn have been discussing this for a few weeks now on what is our heart telling us. And Quinn asked me straight up, man to man, what are you going to vote? And I told him, this church has a vote. I'm just the one that has to cast it. It's not John's vote. This is Sweeney Methodist Church's vote. That's why we decided to have this. I am not making this decision for the church, for the conference, for anything. I'm making it for us as a congregation. So are you going to put it out of balance? That's why we wanted to have this to see what's the best way to go. We wanted to talk to y'all because we have not all been in a room where we could express our opinions. But maybe somebody's not comfortable saying that. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. And I mean, that's something that we'll, we'll have to discuss. How's the best yeah. way to handle it? Blind vote where everybody's more comfortable and all that. You know, we'll, we'll discuss that. What I guess I'm all, since we're doing it as a person, I've expressed this to Quinn and everything, to everybody else. We've had a lot more information today. I told him my opinion as of now, I've been a United Methodist since 1994, I believe, 94, 95. I am a United Methodist. I am a conservative United Methodist. I am a biblical United Methodist. Everything we've talked about. Nothing is set in stone right now. If we join the global, it's because the conference is forcing everybody's going to go that way. At that point, the decision is, do we stay global or do we go back to United Methodist? The United Methodists ain't changing in the books until at least 2024. I've heard half the people I've talked to, my former ministers and my mentors, saying it's a done deal, it's going to change to discipline in 2024. The other half says, no, there's just going to be rogue people out there. So in my personal opinion, I'm a United Methodist till 2024 at this moment because nothing is going to change till then as far as this church and our conference unless something happens at the end of the month. At that there point, has been, hmm? there has been. Because there are bishops that are allowing it 
As a, yes, as a national Methodist church. I'm worried about this church right now. If we change with the global because the conference changes, then the congregation has to decide later do we want to go global or whatever. If we don't go global and we stay United Methodist, in 2024, we still have that choice to make. If they change the discipline and we're saying, okay, we don't want to be part of that, we can go global, we can go free, we can go Baptist. That's exactly right. Well, but that's it. The global apparently has a catch on that. The global is the one that has disciplinary with that, where the Methodists don't. Yes. So. Exactly. unless our conference goes there. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. We don't know what's going to happen at the end of the month. That's true, but generally... Right. And that's, that's the thing that... Yeah, that's what worries us is about the church buildings, the church things like that. Right now, we're about the church's soul. You know, and as far as that goes, by our discipline, nothing changes until at least 2024. And like Gwen says, it's going to take a heck of a vote and a lot of things going to happen. It's possible. It's possible nothing happens, or maybe they finally decide, okay, let's put some meat in the discipline and take care of these rogue bishops that's not going to follow that. That'd be my perfect scenario. Yeah, they won't do that, but that would be the perfect scenario. And that's it. And that's where the global's fighting right now. So, so. I don't, I don't want to stifle conversation. I do want to encourage folks to speak into the mic yeah, as the okay. mic continues. That's okay, that's all I had to say. Uh, the, excuse, the question was earlier, why is why are we the ones, or why are the conservatives leaving? And this is my opinion. Uh, when this started 50 years ago, this debate started 50 years ago, the conservatives held a clear majority. Since then, this majority has eroded to just a very, I believe it's a razor, razor edge majority that's mostly swung by the swing vote is what somebody had already said, the African churches, Filipino churches, and I believe the European churches. And I believe the leaders of the conservative side are thinking that we are going to lose this, this battle and to the progressives. And when the progressives come in power, the book of discipline will be changed. And I think what the, what the um, conservatives are wanting to do Let's go ahead, let's separate, let's get about the business of Jesus Christ and wish our brothers on the other side, you know, we wish them well. But we're separating because we need to get, a, get to the business of making disciples for Jesus Christ because we're wasting so much time and effort fighting this fight that's not going to go away because the progressives are just as passionate as the conservatives. Um, one other thing that I, and I'll yield the floor, um, in the conference, I think in 2019, 
there was a new paragraph in the Book of Discipline. I believe it's 2553, or, and it was outlines how churches can separate themselves from the UMC. And this had to do with human sexuality. So they were given the churches that wish to a path to separate. And this is what a lot of churches have used this particular paragraph. Now this paragraph will go away in 2023. And I'm not sure why they chose that date. Maybe they thought the general conference would happen and they would be able to go on and do something else. Um, that's my opinion. I think the reason is why the conservatives are pushing because they feel like they're going to lose the majority. And, yeah, that's that's my opinion. And also, they they're wanting to let's just separate, let's get about the business of carrying out a church and being disciples of Jesus Christ because the fight is not going to go away. It talks about the, uh, the paying of the apportionments, apportionments excuse me, and paying. the <laughs> unfunded liabilities that we discussed earlier. That's that yeah. paragraph. The, the apportionments uh, dealing with the, uh, the, 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 the preacher's uh, retirement and but once you satisfy that, then they turn the property over to you, and you can decide what you want to do. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, Russell. I'm probably getting ready to be very unpopular in this room. Sorry. Um, I want to go to church with my church family. I don't want to... I don't want to go to another church. I don't want to learn another church. I don't want to learn, you know, I'm open to people coming here and learning them. But however this plays out and however this goes down, if we are not worshiping here, we can take our Bibles and we can worship in a cafeteria. We can. We can still be together. But... That's what I had to say. I just had to say it. Thank you, Kayla. Are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> oh, there is? Okay, then I'll read fast. Um, this book, the Holy Bible, it specifically warns us as a people, as in the second epistle of Peter, about false teachers says, but false prophets also arose among the people. In the same way, false teachers will come among you. They will introduce destructive opinions and deny the master who bought them, bringing quick destruction on themselves. Somebody needs to go tell these liberal people who are going against this book that it's not us going to judge them. Because further on in in chapter 2 of this particular book, it says that those people will be bound in chains in the darkness awaiting judgment. Maybe what we need to do is reach out in love to all of our friends who are not following the book and say, we don't want you to go to hell. So why don't you do this? Uh, at this point, I would like to ask the question on the uh, the four uh, resolutions. Resolutions. Thank you. The one that says two thirds is that two thirds majority on all votes, or is just the one vote? It, to, to answer the question for those uh, who need to hear over the mic, yes, the two-thirds majority resolution applies to the vote to change denominations. Okay. Why are we selective? What do you mean? Why are we just selecting to limit it to the one vote? Uh, I, would, I would be speculating. 
I mean, if, if we're going to mimic the United States government in our decision-making process. We don't necessarily want, that's not necessarily the intent. Well, from what I've been hearing about all of these discussions about moving this, moving that, and why we're doing this, in order to change the U.S. Constitution, you have to have two-thirds of the states say, yay, it is possible. Maybe what we need to do is put a resolution forward to the council, the overall council, and say, we don't think we should split the church, but we think it should be two-thirds of the churches that do, that have to vote to make something happen. We don't necessarily have to tear the United Methodist Church apart. We can fix it. And the question is, do we want to fix it or do we want to let it go down in flames? And that's a question we're all going to have to answer to ourselves. Well, thank you for speaking, Johnny. Um, I, do, I do want to comment. I think it is somewhat of a slippery slope to start throwing around hellfire rhetoric over a teaching of this. And this is going to be more of my personal pastoral opinion, you could call it. I'm not speaking um, as, you know, I, I, believe it or not, I'm not in the business of telling people what to think. That's actually not how I consider my profession to be. I consider my profession to be sharing the love and grace of God that I've experienced in my life um, with people. That's what I consider to be my profession. I do think that you referenced the, the second Peter passage. To th throw that around over a theology of human sexuality is not something I would be comfortable to do. And in fact, I, I am pretty, pretty weary of it, uh, to be honest. And, and I, I say this as humbly and lovingly as I, as I hope that I can come across as but, you know, we talk about st throwing stones, and I think people on both sides of this issue have been guilty of throwing some stones, if I'm being completely honest. Because, you know, I mean, we are who we are here in this church, and we have had some stones thrown at us. I think we feel right. You're homophobic. You're hateful. You don't have love. You don't have grace. We've been, we've been hit by some of those stones, right? I think if we were being honest with ourselves, we've been guilty of throwing some stones as well. You know, thing like, you don't believe in the Bible. You are a, a heretic. You are a, you know, believe in God. And I just, I don't, I don't think that's the case. I, I know people who are on both sides of this issue, who believe in God, who believe in the authority of Scripture, and who do want to go and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We don't all have to agree on this theology of human sexuality. It's an impossible task for us all to agree on that until the good Lord comes back any time, by the way. This, this is something that I wish we weren't splitting over. This is something that I wish we weren't splitting over and it breaks my heart that we are. If, you know, it's one thing to deny that God exists. It's one thing to deny that salvation is through Jesus Christ. It's one thing to deny that Jesus Christ truly rose from the dead and secured our resurrection. Those are things I might be willing to get, uh, get into a ring and fight over. Something like this, I wish we weren't. I wish we weren't. It makes me sad as well. And I, I suppose I would just encourage you all to, I know emotions are high, but the people on the other side of this issue might be saying, hey, those people don't actually love other people. And if they don't love other people, how can they know the love of God, as First John says, and therefore maybe they're in danger of going to hell. I, I mean, I haven't heard that conversation, but the logic can work itself against us if we want to take it there. But do we want to take it there? I would hope, I would hope not. But I don't mean to stifle conversation um, or, to, or to stifle anyone's uh, speaking. So are there other questions or comments at this time?
to say one thing that I think most people will agree with as of my closing, whether other people do or not, no matter. Um, I don't hate gays or any of these people. I don't agree with what they're doing, but I don't hate them. I have absolutely no problem with them coming in and joining us in a church service. We're sinners, they're sinners. And if they want to come in here, they're welcome. Um, I know several years ago at least, Gail told me we had uh, one gay member here. I don't know who it was, don't care. I know that we've had uh, gay people that's come in to visit with us. I don't care about that. What I care about is, is I don't want gays to come in and take leadership positions within the church, within the, con the conference, within the whole global, and then dictate or try to dictate their sexual preferences to the rest of us. And that is where I think this whole global Methodist group is going. They do not want them to do that. Where the people in the West Coast, in New England, do. And uh, as it mentioned here, they needed to be disciplined for what they're doing. They're not getting disciplined. There was an attempt to discipline some of them, and they had a bunch of uh, bishops, and oh no, we can't do that, we can't do that. So they let it go. And I think that they made a mistake when they did it. But that's my personal belief. But I don't think anybody in here hates gays to the point that if they find out they're gay, they meet them at the door and you can't come in here. Because I think all of us would accept them coming in as members, but not as leadership. And uh, I don't want everybody to go home thinking, oh, we're terrible, or they're terrible, or somebody else is terrible. It's the uh, fact that um, we just have a different idea about who can run it because most of the gays who do come in in a leadership position have a tendency to, not all, but most, have a tendency to push being gay or whatever they are versus um, God. And that's what we all need to be pushing is God. Thank you for sharing, Mike. Oh, oh, the, Mike, the mic. Yeah. I thought it. I caught it about the time you did. Uh, I will make um, another call for questions or comments. I do want to circle back to, before we depart here, the issue of John Playa's vote and, and how we would, as a congregation, would like to go about handling that. But before we do, are there final questions or comments? Okay. John, um, did you, I guess, or oh, an open question then, uh, how are we going to do this? There's nothing that we necessarily have to do. There's nothing in the discipline about, uh, technically speaking, John Playa can vote how he wishes. He has offered that he would like to vote the heart of the congregation. An inauspicious start. Okay. Um, yes, I am. Sorry. Yes, I am asking for uh, input. Yeah. I suggest a secret ballot vote. They, you know, we come into the worship hall here, and we there's somebody out there that checks our name off the list as members. We cast our vote, put it in the box, walk out. For those that are shut-ins then I think there should be Quinn or a designated person in authority to, to take that. That's doable. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Okay. 
All right, thank you, Mary. I appreciate your input. Yes. Yes. Uh, the question was when the vote. Um, John has to make the vote. Uh, it, it, I, I, might, I believe you. Okay. The current agenda is that John Plyer will be casting his vote alongside everyone else who can vote on Tuesday, May 31st at annual conference. Thank you for that. And can we also make accommodations for people that whatever date we set, if they're not going to be in town or such forth, that the, we can cast our ballot, our ballot in an envelope like we're talking about? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And I'm more than willing to sit at a table and check names off or do whatever I need to do to help. Thank you for that. Uh, other input on this, or are we pretty happy with this tenuous plan? Well, <laughs> uh, satisfied to the extent that we need to be. Emma, did you have a question or a comment? or You, you can just speak up and I can uh, repeat it. Okay, well, thank you for that. You go ahead. Y'all yeah. <laughs> yeah, know I don't ever shut up. Uh, one more thing I'd like to say, John, is um, when this vote is done, I, I mean, it, the choice is yours. I would pray that you would do what's best for our church. But I would like to, after our voting, have a, a private ceremony, whatever you want to call it, to laying of hands on you to go to this conference and do what needs to be done. Amen. Absolutely. It's, uh, could, could you speak into the mic or? Okay, I just want to make sure I understand that on May 31st or whatever date it is, He's voting on these four resolutions. As a lay delegate, he can vote on anything that comes up for a vote at the annual conference. There is all sorts of stuff that's going to be voted on that does not immediately apply to the denominational issue. Okay. So, I, I mean, I'm just kind of guessing, you know, the hate speech is one. I mean, to me, the first two he mentioned were easy votes. And those are pretty obvious votes. Then the third thing, which was the first thing Quinn talked about, the special conference, you'd be voting on whether to go with the, the whole conference to go to GMC. Is that what you'd be voting on? To leave the, and to go to GMC, right? That is correct. Okay, and if, and then the fourth thing you'd vote on would be. Or simple. Okay, so you'd be voting for either 51% or 66 or 67%, okay. So that's you're voting on that, and how are you voting? You're voting 51% to go to GMC, or 51%, I mean, which way is The vote is to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church okay. and join the new denomination. So that's the third thing. The yay vote would be to, to go, yes. The yay vote would be to 51% would be, that's good, or To go, unless okay. the two-thirds resolution passes. Okay, and then the last one is, you're saying we would go at the conference, yes or no? which I'm assuming three of the four, you probably already know what you're doing, but the fourth thing you probably don't know yet what you're doing. Okay. Last call this evening. Well then folks, uh, I will call, bring us to a close in a moment with a word of prayer. Before I do that, and hopefully stop making that sound happen, uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I know that this is a difficult topic, and I know that there are strong feelings about this topic. I'm really grateful to have a church, though, that cares, to, that cares and does want to be faithful and to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And um, I am looking forward to... And Were there any questions on Facebook? I've been monitoring, and no. No. Uh, I am looking forward to uh, getting back to, well, 
making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world in whatever way, in whatever time. And I'm grateful for you all as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this hard work that you have set before us to do. Not because it is easy and not because we necessarily enjoy all of it, Lord, but because this is the work that you have given us to do. Lord, send your Holy Spirit upon us all across this entire denomination with wisdom, with peace, with love and grace and all the good fruits of the Spirit. And Lord, protect us and keep us under the shadow of your wings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Greg? On impression while he's recovering from surgery. Oh, yeah, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> and they never asked him to sing on mic again. God bless.